two doors I wouldn't open if I could go back and do it again. I think it's acting on the pornography. Starting to look at porn just became a snowball effect that I couldn't control and then led to really acting on it with men. And then number two, the alcohol. I can't imagine that I would have stepped out that far if it weren't for those two doors. I don't know that I would have had the guts. My persona was generally kind of timid and that sort of thing. I don't think that apart from alcohol abuse that I would have been out in the gay bars looking for someone. Thank you for tuning in to the Removing Barriers podcast. I'm Jay. And I'm MCG. And we're attempting to remove barriers so we can all have a clear view of the cross. This is episode 51 of the Removing Barriers podcast. And this is the 11th in the series of How Were Your Barriers Removed? In this episode, we'll find out how Matt's barriers were removed when he came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matt, welcome to the Removing Barriers podcast. Thank you for having me. Great. We're glad that we were able to book you. Thank you for putting us in your busy schedule. I just want to say this. Due to the sensitive topics that may be discussed in this episode, parental guidance might be recommended, but we want to get to know everything about Matt and his testimony. So tell me, Matt, what state or country were you born in? USA in a town called Clearfield, Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania, about four hours from any major city, three hours from Pittsburgh, four hours from Philly. It's near Penn State, about 45 minutes away from Penn State University. Tell me about that small town. Pretty conservative, small town. The coal industry was the biggest industry when I was growing up, and it kind of fizzled out with environmental regulations. And now Walmart put a distribution center there, so that's, I think, the biggest employer at the moment. So it's kind of a Walmart town. Pretty friendly people. I grew up on a motorcycle, dirt bike riding on the hills, kind of behind the house. And that comes in handy over here in Cambodia. That's the primary mode of transportation. I went hunting a lot with my dad. So hunting is very important to the culture back home and really enjoyed that. Yeah, it sounds fun. I grew up in the Caribbean, but totally different. But that was fun. So tell me about your family. What kind of family were you born in? Was this a Christian family? Your mom, dad were together? I was born in a Christian home, very solid Christian home. My mom's side of the family was Christian actually before my dad met my mom. And when he met her, my mom really kind of put the words through his wife, who told my dad that if he wanted to date his daughter, that he would need to start attending service. So he started going to church because he was attracted to my mom and eventually came to Christ, praise the Lord. And that was around 1975. And then he ultimately became an usher and treasurer and later an elder. And now he's a head deacon in the church. And back at that time, they were the leaders of the youth group for a period of time. When I was part of the youth group, they put me in a Christian school next to the church. I was just very well churched, very much memorizing scripture. And that really became useful later in life when the Lord would call me to repentance. That's great. So you described how your family was a solid Christian family in church reading, memorizing the word, but it sounds like that you weren't saved until later on. Could you describe what your life and upbringing were like before your salvation? That's kind of a doctrinal debate that we could have about whether or not I was actually saved and then went out into sin after that. Okay. And so I, I kind of usually steer clear of that, but I gave my life to Christ in terms of, yes, I prayed the sinner's prayer, but did I really have a close relationship with him where I was hearing from him? And he was leading my life, and it was a real, genuine relationship. No, not really. Not until I got out and experienced some difficult things that I couldn't get myself out of, and I needed a Savior, and he really came to my rescue. Yeah, in a previous episode of How Were Your Barriers to Move, we were talking to Josh, and he too was raised in a Christian home, and we were talking about, you know, I guess the term for it is easy believism where a lot of kids are taught, you know, hey, pray this prayer, ask Jesus in your heart, but they never really come to a full realization of their sin and their need of a savior. So it seems like you had something like that. Quite honestly, I think it's something that the churches, especially Bible-believing churches, need to probably look a little bit deeper into 
you know, Amen. are we really truly reaching our kids? Are they truly being saved or are they making a profession but no possession? Amen. I think I did not have a deep understanding. and I don't know that that was anyone's fault necessarily, but especially coming from a Christian home and I was a fairly meek, gentle relative to the other kids, maybe not so bad in the early years. And so my sin wasn't so real to me. I wasn't so aware of it. And when I went so deep out into the world, it became undeniable. Like, wow, I really made a wreck of things and there's no other way out except for repentance. Mm. So when you talk about when you came to the realization of your sin, were you already an adult at that point? Or were you still maybe a teenager? Or where were you in terms of the progression of your life when you came to the full realization of your sin? I felt an attraction to men about 12 years old around puberty when the boys started to like the girls. And I had an attraction to the boys and felt that I couldn't control that, that temptation. I know now that I didn't have to follow that. And I knew that I didn't have to follow that at the time. But I'm saying that the temptation was there. And I prayed the Lord would take the temptation away. And it didn't go away. And so knowing that it was wrong, I knew the word and I grew up in the church and I knew that it was wrong and hated myself for feeling that temptation. But when it didn't go away, I made poor choices and I followed those choices. I followed that temptation deeper and deeper. I remember the early steps looking at pictures and magazines, underwear models sort of thing, and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And, and after a while, you need more to kind of satisfy that fix, like like an addiction type of thing where you're kind of chasing that initial high that you can never really get back to. And so it became kind of a landslide, like a domino effect. So pictures went to videos and heterosexual videos and then homosexual videos and deeper into that. And then after a while, like my dad would say, if you window shop long enough, eventually you'll buy something. And so I first had to get drunk that was a gateway. I got drunk for the first time about 21 years old, and it was not long after that till I felt like, okay, now my fear's gone, my inhibitions are gone when I drink. I have a way to act out on these fantasies. And that's what I did. So when I think back of kind of lessons learned from my testimony, I think two doors I wouldn't open if I could go back and do it again. I think it's Acting on the pornography, starting to look at porn just became a snowball effect that I couldn't control and then led to really acting on it with men. And then number two, the alcohol. I can't imagine that I would have stepped out that far if it weren't for those two doors. I don't know that I would have had the guts. My persona was generally kind of timid and that sort of thing. I don't think that apart from alcohol abuse that I would have been out in the gay bars looking for someone. Anyway, it was probably about 28 years old that I sent a letter to my family, told them about, quote unquote, who I was and who I believed I was because the world had programmed me that way. And I had bought into the lies of Satan that this is who I am, homosexuality is an identity. And they went to war in prayer and fasting. That was a directive from the pastor that had dedicated me as a baby, was still with our family. and. They went to war on bended knee, shoulder to shoulder, and stayed together through the hard times and prayed and fasted. I think it was roughly four and a half years total. My dad just recently corrected me on that period of time. I think he said four and a half years from the time that they started to pray and fast until the Lord delivered me. So he did a lot of things gradually, reminding me of end times prophecy. I was in fear of judgment of the Lord. I knew I wasn't ready to meet him. 9-11 happened during that kind of period that I was out in the gay life. And I was crying when I saw that on TV, the towers going down, knowing that the Lord is bringing judgment on my country for turning their back on him. We were founded to serve him, to worship the Lord and turned our back on him. And we received significant judgment for it. And I thought, I'm going to be next. I'm not ready to meet the Lord. And I was very much in self-destruct mode in my addictions. And so I didn't turn back then. I was too prideful, but the Lord sent a street evangelist across my path when I lived in Pittsburgh and stood behind me in the line at McDonald's, tapped me on the shoulder, singled me out of probably hundreds of people that day during the rush hour at lunch and really felt a heart for me. And I know now that the Lord led him to feel that way and to single me out. But at the time I was confused 
And I thought, wow, this guy doesn't know me from anybody. And he's asking me what I would do if I died today, if I was ready to meet the Lord. I thought, what a strange question from somebody who doesn't know me and doesn't know my family or anything. So that started to kind of clue me in that the Lord might be doing something from the throne. Mm. And I couldn't imagine because I felt that I was so such an excluded kind of a, a category that could never come home, that could never be like the gospel applies to you folks in the church, but it doesn't apply to me because I'm a freak. I have this weird feeling, this weird temptation, thoughts coming through my head that nobody else seems to have. Everywhere I look, everybody seems to be cleaned up and relatively good person. And, and I'm this weird guy with these weird temptations, and weird thoughts. So the Lord used all that, and it really ultimately came to a point where I needed to come to the end of myself. I really needed to hit rock bottom in my addictions before I would look up. So I had to get on my back, per se, before I would look up. I had to get to a point where I knew that there's no other way out except the God that I knew as a child who was with us and comforted us when my mom was in a terrible car accident. And the other guy passed away, and he was a believer, but my mom had a terrible time dealing with that and coping with that, and the Holy Spirit was there in the room when the pastor came to pray with us. I have memories of very vivid things that the Lord did where it was undeniable that He's not some religion or some teaching, that He's the true God, the living God. And so I remembered that if He can do those things, that He could get me out, that I needed to repent. And I wasn't ready until I got so, so severely addicted that I felt it was kind of a matter of life and death, that if I continued in my sin, I continued in the alcohol, the cocaine, that I would end up being a quiet funeral like many of my acquaintances from the gay bars. At that point, I was 32 years old. Mm -hmm. So tell me, you said you started having these attraction for the same sex at about 12. Being raised in a Christian home, did you feel comfortable to go to your dad? What was your relationship between you and your dad? Usually they say, oh, if someone, I think this might be false belief, but they say, oh, if someone is leaning towards a gay lifestyle, you know, either they don't have a fat in their life or they're looking for confirmation from a strong male figure that they don't have. What was the relationship like between you and your dad? And did you feel like you could have taken this to your parents? Um, my relationship with my dad has been good my whole life. But in the early years, I was very timid. I was very meek and gentle. And I think in order to really answer the question, I would have to go back to what I feel from Scripture is the truth, kind of the Scripture being the backdrop of my testimony is that we live in a spiritual war. And I remember the early years when I was a kid and laying in bed at night and feeling demonic kind of forces in the room and demonic presence. I remember being terrified of certain things. I would see something on the news and become terrified of it, that there was someone who was poisoning the Tylenol at some point, probably 1985 or something. And they called him the Tylenol man, or maybe I called him that. And I, they said that I was waking up screaming with night terrors about the Tylenol man who's coming to get me. So there were just things that the enemy was there and keeping me in fear of certain things. And I felt inadequate that I was naturally kind of timid and meek and gentle and not very masculine compared to the other boys. So the boys in the neighborhood were hyper-masculine and want to play kickball and baseball and get out here and join us and all that. And I felt like if I go out and join them, they're going to see that I throw like a girl, that I run like a girl. I can't do that. So I would become increasingly isolated. And my dad was also very masculine, just like most men. He wanted to hunt with me. He wanted to take me out in the woods. He wanted to hike up mountains with me and do manly stuff. And he wanted to do that a lot. I mean, he wanted to be very close with me. And, and I kind of shied away a bit from that because I didn't associate with it. I didn't relate to it like I should have, like a regular boy would have. But let's say Thanksgiving, Christmas, I use these as an example. You would see the men on one side of the room talking about hunting and sports or whatever, and the women on the other side of the room grouped together. I would be with the women talking about the next style of jeans that's coming out next year or something like that. So 
there was something about the inadequacy and comparing myself to others. I wasn't confident in who the Lord made me to be until after he delivered me in new life and showed me, look, it doesn't matter if this guy's real masculine or this guy's feminine or that one's like this, or you like this color or certain kind of music or something. You're not gay. There's no such thing as gay. I created you to be a man. I created man and woman. That's it. Anything else is a perversion, a twisting of the truth. Don't follow your temptation. It's not who you are. I didn't know any of that as a kid. I just knew I had a weird feeling. And the church, really, like you said at that point, I think you were alluding to the church, especially a small town, 1985 era, was not really equipped. They didn't know what to do with it. They see this guy's kind of effeminate, but I don't know what to say about that. So I just kind of pretend like it's not here. And hopefully with more testimonies like this and more kind of falling back on scripture and the testimonies together, we'll be better equipped as a church to fight these satanic attacks. Yeah, I know you told us before we start recording that you and your wife don't have any kids. But for me as a father raising boys and for our listeners who may be raising boys, as a matter of fact, even girls, how can we spot these things in our child's heart or child's mind at an early age and how can a father or parents kind of say you know what my child might not be the macho man that you expect him to be or you want him to be but you can still guide his heart to christ how can parents navigate this because you're here you are raising a genuine christian home loving parents and then yet you still go that direction how can parents not make the same mistake that maybe your parents have made i guess to put the question more succinctly. For that, I would come back to the spiritual war. This is what's brought up in the kind of psychological research that's going on about homosexuality. They come back to things like this. And maybe there's some value in it. Everybody's story is a little bit different. But now that I'm on the other side of it, I'm the ex-gay ministry part of it, where I'm seeing guys who have come out of the gay lifestyle and trying to follow Christ and hearing their testimonies and reading their testimonies. And there's a pretty big proportion, a pretty big percentage of those folks grew up in a Christian home, son of a pastor, all that kind of stuff. So that to me points to, hey, this is a demonic attack. He's coming after the ones that are chosen to do something for the Lord. Oh, wow. The ones the Lord. I would have never guessed that statistic. So you're saying that the most of the gays that you're witnessing to in your ministry, ex-gay ministry, that most of them are coming from Christian homes, not the world. Many of the ones are coming from Christian homes. So my thinking, my deduction from that is that Satan already has the ones in the world. Why attack them? Why not come after and confuse? And, and really, if you think about it, it's the ultimate attack on the home because he comes in after the child who the parents love more than anything on earth, right? And then it forces the parents to choose between the Lord and his word or their kid. How are they going to turn their back on their kid? That was my situation. So it was really an Abraham and Isaac kind of situation where ultimately my dad and mom, especially my dad, my mom had a harder time with it. But eventually my dad said, this is a spiritual war and it's way over our heads. I was calling three in the morning, screaming demonic things at my mom, you know, cursing and swearing and carrying on. And he said, let's step back and maybe we lost Matt. Maybe we'll never see him again. But it came down to, I was forcing them. You will, you will approve my sin. This is who I am. Hmm. And it's like, well, in order to approve your sin, we have to turn our back on God's word. And I didn't realize that. I just thought it was about me. It was really a matter of the enemies talking through me. I hereby demand that you turn your back on the Lord and his word. Well, because you, because you, our son, are involved in this, and I guess God says it's okay now. Hmm. Not true. So they chose the Lord over me, and ultimately they chose me because the Lord delivered at the 11th hour, and I believe part of that was due to their obedience. They really went to war, and they saw it as a spiritual war, went to war in prayer and fasting, put the Lord's word before me, which was really ultimately choosing me. They spoke difficult truth that I didn't want to hear. They could have told me, well, God loves everybody and everything's going to work out. 
just have fun with your boyfriend in the meantime or something, but they didn't. They told me, we love you, but we just can't condone this. We can't say that it's anything other than sin. That's it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord, yes. So you probably have alluded to this already, but what were those barriers that you think that were preventing you? Dive deeper into those barriers that you think were definitely saying, hey, preventing you from turning, coming back to Christ, being saved. I think it began with fear. I think in the early years, you have that temptation, that strange feeling, that strange desire. You don't know what to do with it. It becomes kind of the deep, dark secret. It starts to come out in the way you walk, in the way you talk, and you feel like I'm... uh, my voice hasn't changed, and the other boys' voices have changed. I throw like a girl and walk like a girl. You start to be bullied in school, and the more people tell you that this is who you are, the more you tend to believe it. And I think it starts in fear, and that's how the enemy works. It kind of molds and shapes. And we follow him further and further down the path of destruction and start to look more and more like him. Just like we follow the Lord down the narrow, difficult path, we start to look more and more like him. So I think it started in fear. And then after I followed my temptation, my deceitful heart, Jeremiah 17, I followed my deceitful heart out into the world and tried to find fulfillment and satisfaction in that. And then it became a matter of pride. It was the barrier. So at first it's fear, then it's pride driving. Then it's kind of like, well, I came out here and now I have to prove to those guys, I have to prove to my family, the church that what I did is really okay. Maybe not for everyone, but at least for me, if it's who I am, then I'm going to prove to them that it works, prove that it's just the same as a heterosexual relationship. So I, I kind of pattern things after my parents' relationship in a weird way. Two men together, I'm trying to still do what I saw with my parents because I felt like their marriage was the best example I had and it really worked. So strange things, very much counterfeit, Satan counterfeits. So I would say it's pride that held me back. And once I sinned and sinned so much, the mental picture that I've had is that it's like a stockpile behind me, like a stockpile of trash that I feel like I'm never going to get rid of it, that there's no way I can get through this. And there's no turning back now. I've already come this far. I can't be forgiven and all that stuff. So it's pride and guilt. And those were the barriers. And it really took prayer and fasting. I really recommend that for families going through this, that they would go to war in prayer and fasting for their loved ones because the Lord really did something at this point and then maybe six months later, something else, and then reminds me of scripture at this during this business meeting at work when you would never expect something would come like that. Maybe through an unbeliever says something to me or a homeless person, all kinds of stuff were happening that no human being could orchestrate. And then when the Lord opened the door, they stood on difficult truth. And I had to come to the end of myself. And that's really the answer to your question is that I don't have an easy solution other than I really had to come to that breaking point. I really had to come to rock bottom before I would look up. And I think sadly, that's the reality for a lot of people in the LGBT because it's so rooted. Mm. It's so indoctrinated what we're taught now everywhere and this is who you are, and this is who you are. So nobody can even say anything to you anymore because now you're coming at the very core of who I think I am. Nobody can correct many folks in the LGBT lifestyle. So I think a lot of times it needs to be rock bottom. Yeah, I know you call yourself a prodigal, and that sounds so much like the prodigal story where their son had to come to himself. My pastor actually was preaching on this recently. A lot of times parents don't want to let their kids come to a point where they come to themselves and realize, hey, you know, my father have all these things. Why am I here in this mess? And it seemed like you had to really get to the pig pen, eat the food from the swine before you actually come to yourself. Amen. Matt, let me ask you this question. You've answered it already. I'm hoping that you could go a little more in depth about how those barriers were moved. You attribute it to the prayers and the fasting of your family members, realizing that they're engaged in spiritual warfare, and this isn't something that they can fight with their physical capabilities. This isn't something that they could wield any kind of human reasoning or human, any kind of dialectic means to try and reason you out of this lifestyle. It was purely warfare. 
you know, they got on their knees and they prayed and they fasted. Now, typically Christians understand prayer, but I found that Christians don't, or at least maybe I should speak for myself, we don't have a clear understanding of what fasting is. Maybe if we define it, we could say, oh, it's going without food for a while. But is there more to fasting that you think Christians should know about when it comes to dealing with spiritual warfare and subsequently having barriers like this removed? Obedience is better than sacrifice comes to mind. Amen. And when the Lord delivered me from the gay lifestyle and then I was walking out of it, I really needed to get into the Word. That was the biggest thing is to be in the Word every day. And the renewing of the mind through the reading of the Word, kind of washing out all those lies that I believed and all the indoctrination that comes when you just walk out of the house or turn on the TV just needs to be cleansed and washed out. And so I just started out, and there were times when I read the larger volumes than this. My dad said, you know what? Read two pages of the Word every day. Keep it simple. You try to read 30 chapters in a day, that's not sustainable. You have to come up with something you can do for the rest of your life. It's not a sprint. It's an endurance run, right? So sometimes I would read more, but I learned from that example. And so the same thing with prayer and fasting. My parents really advocated, keep it simple. Skip a lunch. Not 40 days of some big ordeal, but skip lunch today. And then a couple of days later, maybe skip a lunch and, and pray together during that time or, you know but they didn't really make a ritual of it. It was just to show the Lord, we really need your response from this. We really need action. Put yeah. some power behind the prayer. Mm. So Matt, tell us, how were those barriers eventually removed? When did you come to that point? I know you just tell us what the barriers were that you had to come to the end of yourself. What happened when you came to the end of yourself? How were those barriers eventually removed and God break you loose from this? train of sin. So I mentioned that the Lord would do something here and then maybe six months later, something else and something else. And so he had been working over the course of several years there to gradually bring me back to him and to bring me to repentance. But your question kind of zeroes me in on the final days, the final hours. Right. And I remember being in a business meeting, and this was when I worked for a bank in Pittsburgh. And we were up in a tower and in a business meeting, and it was in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008, and there were bank consolidations. And I worked in the kind of the back office of the bank that was handling the consolidations. Our department was really down in the weeds on the consolidations of bank mergers and acquisitions and that sort of thing. And I remembered from childhood some of the interpretations of end-time prophecy is that there'll be one world bank. So that to me was always at the forefront of my mind. It was hard to escape. And I remember earthquakes in diverse places. So around that time, there was a strange earthquake in Pittsburgh, which was really unusual, really out of the ordinary. And so the Lord was bringing end-times prophecy back to mind. And we had a meeting in that tower in Pittsburgh, and they were going around and they had a chief diversity officer had just been hired and she came in and talked to us as a group and she was talking about i think she said something about that ultimately there may be just one bank or she said something that alluded to that and that coming out of her mouth brought a tear down my eye the lord brought conviction reminding me of prophecy and that was when i walked out and walked down the street during my lunch break, and there were Mennonites there, like Mennonite missionaries on the street that I'll never forget, and they had CDs and things to hand out. And the one handed me a CD, and I reached out and grabbed the CD, like a DVD kind of thing. At the end of the workday that day, I went home and put it up on top of my, I guess it was a CD player at the time, and I didn't listen to it. It was kind of like, oh! Like, I, I don't want to come out of, the, you know, I was so reluctant to come out of that life that I had been so rude and grounded in. And so I guess it was that same weekend. I think that was Thursday. And then Friday was the next day. And it was a holiday weekend. It was Memorial Day in May. So I had met someone online. I was meeting a lot of men online I'd never seen before and, and trying to get together for sex, which was a normal thing in that lifestyle for many especially the men living in a gay lifestyle. It's very, very common, regardless of what people want to admit. 
And so he was coming in from New Jersey on the train and he was going to spend a weekend with me. And I was doing sit-ups on the floor, preparing for him to come to visit. And I was trying to present myself as well put together. And meanwhile, I was very much addicted and coming out of my drunken stupor from the night before and putting Visine in my eyes to make it through the workday and going into shakes like in the early afternoon and that kind of thing. But I would try to present myself as well put together on the outside. So I'm doing sit-ups on my filthy apartment floor and I feel this tightness in my chest, like the war over the souls of men really made real, really happening in real time. And the Lord's reminding me of end times prophecy and the earthquakes in diverse places and pestilences and all that. And the enemy is kind of like, this is who you are and the guilt and the things that I had already done that I could never come out of this. There was just a real physical tightness in my chest as I'm doing the sit-ups. And it was as if Satan has kind of me by the throat, like in a death grip. And then the Lord's saying, there's only one way out. It's full surrender. You must repent. And so I said, okay, either in my spirit or out loud. And that's when I felt the demonic presence. It might sound quirky or strange to say, but it was a, a real presence that I felt lift from me even to the left side, that sounds strange, but you could say the burden of sin was lifted, that the demonic bondage that I was in, I was in slavery, and that was lifted. Praise the Lord. And that Amen. was later that evening. I got down on my knees at the bed. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I remembered as a kid, and that was the beginning of my new life. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Praise be to the Lord. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, Draw from my well that never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord, come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. There are millions in this world who are seeking For pleasures earthly goods afford But none can match the wondrous treasure That I find in Jesus Christ my Lord Fill my cup, Lord I lift it up, Lord, come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. So my brother. The things that this world gives you Leave hungers that won't pass away My blessed Lord will come and save you If you kneel to Him and humbly pray Fill my cup, Lord I lift it up, Lord Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till.
till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. You're listening to the Removing Barriers podcast. We're sitting down with Matt and we are finding out how were his barriers removed. When we return, we'll find out how we can, as Christians, reach the LGBT community. We'll be right back. Do you have the desire to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints? Answers in Genesis can help. They provide biblically sound books, CDs, DVDs, homeschooling materials, VBS materials, online courses, digital downloads, and the Answers magazine, and more. Plus, tickets to the Creation Museum and Ark Encounter. Go to the Answers Bookstore by clicking the link in the description section below so you too can be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks the reason of the hope that is in you. Matt, how can Christians better reach and better reason with the LGBTQIA plus community when we're trying to talk to them about their salvation, talk to them about their need for a savior, talk to them about impending judgment? How can Christians better reach and reason with them? The quick answer is be honest about our own struggles. I really think that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that even after we come to know Christ, that every Christian still has some sort of temptation towards sin. We still have a sinful nature that we wrestle against. And the difference between the unbeliever and the believer is the believer fights against that temptation, right? Mm -hmm. And fights daily to follow Christ. But I think sometimes we're afraid to admit to those temptations and those struggles. And so we kind of forget that we have them or we're kind of in denial about them. And then somebody walks through the door who is honest about that. It makes us feel uncomfortable and strange. Like now, because he's being honest, am I going to have to be honest? And I think it works a lot better if we're just honest about our own struggles and who we are. The Bible says that for all have sinned. The Bible says that we're works in progress, that we'll finish the work he began until the day of Christ. So no reason to pretend that's not the case. Yeah, and such were some of you, but he awash. Amen. It seems like your parents got this right in terms of hating the sin, but loving the sinner. How can we do that? as Christians, hate the sin, but love the sinner, especially when it comes to the gay community? Back to the last question, that's really the silver bullet if we're looking to reach out to the LGBT, I think. Especially if I'm a person who never has had a homosexual temptation or struggle myself, and I'm going to try to reach out to the LGBT, I think the silver bullet, the best thing I can do is be honest to first build that relationship share the love of Christ and build that trust. And from there, I think when there's an opportunity to be very prayerful, because prayer is the power behind evangelism. And when the Lord brings that open door to not be afraid to speak difficult truth. But I think often before the difficult truth comes, there has to be some kind of humble sharing of our own weaknesses that kind of paves the way. The example I like to use is Let's say that a church wants to reach out to the LGBT and someone who struggles with homosexuality comes to the door, then maybe we first build a relationship with that guy. And then maybe there's a small group Bible study breakout session or something like that. Maybe that's the opportunity. If I feel a heart to witness to him, maybe I try to build that relationship there. And then as the Lord brings an opportunity as we pray, over the next few weeks or months, maybe I say, hey, um, I never struggled with homosexuality, but you know what I have struggled with in the past is pornography, something like that. Most men, I think, at some point have struggled with pornography. And so it would be something that I think would earn the right to be heard from that guy. So it's not like, hey, you, we're a private club here and we have everything all together. You're the bad one. We want to call out your sin. <laughs> Right. I think it would work better from that standpoint. You mentioned earlier, Matt, how sometimes a person within the LGBTQIA community could feel like when someone is talking to them about salvation or Jesus or any attempt to talk to them about their lifestyle, they feel like it's a 
direct and personal attack because their identity is so wrapped up in their sexuality. It's foundational in terms of how they perceive themselves. Do you think that Bible-believing Christians understand that? Or I guess I should ask the question this way. What do you think Bible-believing Christians do not understand about the LGBTQ community, about the people in that community as well? This is a question that I think needs to be thoroughly answered. I think number one is that the temptation, the, the false identity can feel so real. And I mentioned before the scripture in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? it? Yeah. Yeah. And so that is such a key scripture. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. It can feel for all the world, especially I can only imagine if I didn't have a Christian background at all. But even for me, I'm rooted in the word and growing up in the church and still even though I know it's wrong, I really, really know it's wrong, but oh, the hormones are raging in the teen years and you don't have a viable attraction to a woman and it can feel so overpowering. So I guess that's where there should be some compassion. Like, wow, I can only imagine what it must be like for this guy, you know? Number two, that for many, it's not a choice. Like you and I think of a choice not to get too graphic, but I mentioned before, kind of physiologically speaking, from a man's perspective, if you're in the flesh and you're 13, 14, 15 years old, and the other guys are talking about the girls and what happens when they look at a girl, if you know what I mean, and that's not happening to you. And then on the flip side of that, the parents and the People in the church are asking, what about your girlfriend? Where's your girlfriend? When are you going to get married? And that becomes more and more as you get older. And then it's like, how could I be expected to do that when I don't have a viable, I don't function that way, if you know what I mean? Like I would ruin her life and my life. And then you can imagine where something like that can lead to suicide, where especially for a man, where you have that male pride, not in a bad way, but just how the Lord made us. You have that sense of who you're supposed to be. And I think that's where a lot of the suicide comes from. A lot of it also starts with sexual abuse in childhood. And that wasn't my story, but many, many, many that I've talked to, that's the case for them. I think in this struggle, it's really the devil is in the details. You know, It's one of those things that because it's sexual in nature, Nobody really wants to ask the questions that have to be asked to really drill into what exactly is going on here. (laughs) And so I'm trying to do that without being too graphic. But another one, a young man, for example, coming out of the LGBT lifestyle will likely continue to wrestle with homosexual temptation. He may not. The Lord might deliver it from him. He may be completely clean and free. But in my case, and the case of many, many, many other ones that I know, it's been the thorn in our side. It's been something that I pleaded with the Lord, and He didn't take it away. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, whether that's for the purpose of keeping us dependent on Him to keep us humble. Sometimes I think for ministry purpose, if I didn't have the temptation anymore at all, if I didn't have that daily struggle and wrestle with that, that I wouldn't have the capacity to have compassion, shed a tear with another guy who's still struggling. I would forget where I came from. Mm. I think there could be a number of reasons, but that's kind of the reality. And I think that just because somebody comes to Christ and they're honest about that, I think sometimes the church can penalize that. Mm -hmm. Like, well, he's not a mature believer then, because if he were a mature believer, he must have done something wrong or hasn't done something right. Let's put him in another program or something or marginalize him and because he's not quite where he needs to be. And that might not be the case. It might just be where the Lord has him. We don't know why the Lord does what he does. And maybe in some cases it was the person's fault or mistake or something they did or didn't do. But I'm just saying to try not to pass judgment there. Another point that every born again Christian fights against sin doesn't continue to live in it. Like I said before, the difference between unbeliever and believer is the believer wrestles against sin with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ from within and walks in newness of life. So a gay Christian is an oxymoron. 
somebody can't walk the path of homosexuality and the narrow, difficult path that leads to eternal life. They can't walk them at the same time. They're two divergent paths. Another, that an ex-gay man, for example, would not likely be prepared for the day after repentance for dating women. And I think that's so common over here in Cambodian culture. That's very common because it's a collectivist culture. It's very family-oriented kind of like the U.S. several generations ago. Mm. And there's a lot of pressure to get married and have kids. And one man said to me about his son, I just wish he would marry a woman. And I said, wow, for someone who's in that lifestyle and not yet delivered, who doesn't really know how to trust the Lord yet in walking away from it, to keep saying something like that to them can be kind of detrimental because they're just in the flesh. And they feel like there is literally nothing I can do to get rid of this temptation, I feel. It's just who I am. And then you keep saying, I want you to get a wife. I want you to get married. It's like, ah, (laughs) can kind of make them feel frantic. So in my case, it was repentance, put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, got into the word daily, prayer daily in church every week, serving, finding my new identity in Christ, there was a lot of work that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And I'm still not a finished work, but I'm saying those first weeks, months, years, the Lord's doing major, major work, kind of reprogramming all that was messed up right from the beginning. So at that time, I'm getting closer with the Lord. He's the one that pulled me out of the pit. He's the one that I can trust. He's the one that will never leave me or forsake me. He's there for me no matter what. Wow, this is what I was looking for out in the gay bars. And now I found it in the Lord Jesus Christ that Amen. my parents worship. It doesn't even seem like the same God, you know, but he was so different for me in my scenario to lift me out. And he was everything that I needed to be and still is. And I found fulfillment and enduring satisfaction in him and just fell in love with him in a really genuine way. And so that had to happen. And then that's kind of like a process and a process. And then six years later, I met my wife. (laughs) (laughs) But but, (laughs) but it's, you said to me like day one, okay, now I hereby, you know, on behalf of the church, maybe I'm an elder in the church or deacon. I think you should start dating women now and get your life straight. Like a day after I repented, it would be like, I don't even know how to do that. I don't feel any genuine attraction. The Lord promised me a wife, and I thought, okay, you delivered me by that point from alcohol and cocaine and cigarettes and pornography addiction and everything else. I know you can do it. I'm sure, 1,000% sure you can do it, but I can't see it because I have zero attraction to a woman. And that's how it was really for six years. (laughs) It was really truly walk by faith and not by sight, and when I saw her, standing at the entrance of the church and she was the greeter in thailand in the church and i looked at her and i thought wow i'm physically attracted to her to the degree that i know that i'm the man she's the woman i know my role it's not like two girls met that here's my new girlfriend and look at her shoes totally different polar polar opposite from anything that i had experienced before and it wasn't unnatural. The romance was natural from day one. It wasn't like, oh, I need to act like this, kind of fake it till you make it. It wasn't that. It was just the Lord gave training wheels or whatever he did, but he really performed miracles. Praise God. The last point I have here is in reaching out to the LGBT, build a relationship of trust as a first step. We share the gospel over here with the LGBT in Cambodia. People are very, very kind and sweet and People are so kind and sweet and humble, and we have a lot to learn, I think, as Americans from Cambodian types of cultures. Then we went back to the U.S. My wife and I were there during COVID, during the beginning of COVID. We couldn't get back because of the travel restrictions. And so I'm thinking, okay, well, when we go to Walmart, then I'll just do the same thing that I do in Cambodia. I'll just share (laughs) 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 So I, I really got like smacked in the face pretty much we met someone in walmart and i shared with him and it was basic basic testimony it was nothing abrasive or anything the only thing that was 
potentially abrasive was like, why did I choose him to share it with? Obviously, I thought that maybe he had a struggle too, but it was really just my story. Here's what I learned from it, and here's what the Lord did for me. And it was full on attack. After that, found us on Facebook, and we got attacks through family member of his and so on. He had said that I was hitting on him. My wife's standing five feet away. She said, I was there. I saw it. There's no way that you could perceive that to be hitting on him. And another situation similar to that, where everything was fine and shared just my testimony and got a haircut from a guy there. I shared with him and so on, and everything was fine. At the end, we even embraced. I hugged him and left, and everything seemed fine. And then we got home and got full-on assault through Facebook from somebody in his family. And then another one in a drive through situation, just getting food with my wife, shared with somebody else and got attacked by probably five or six different people, family members and friends, everything from we'll see you in hell to whatever happened to judge not lest you be judged. Oh, wow. It's really rough back home. So closest thing that I've come to a silver bullet when American folks are asking me, how can we reach out to the LGBT is to build that relationship first and to be humble about our struggles so that the person has no way to say, he pointed at me and judged me. No, I didn't do that. I told you what the Bible says and that I have struggles of my own and the word of God judges us. We don't judge the word of God judges us. Right. Let's go a little deeper into that, Matt. You talked about how in Cambodia, there's like a humility there, a sweetness. When you talk to people where it doesn't exist in America, do you think that's because, you know, the activism for LGBT is so strong in the U.S. and people just feel emboldened to just be very aggressive about this particular issue? And should Christians be walking on eggshells when it comes to political correctness? Or how should we approach that in the U.S. compared to, say, for example, Cambodia? Yeah, we kind of hit on spiritual warfare Mm -hmm. before quite a bit. And I would come back to the spiritual warfare on this, that the U.S., I mean, as many mistakes as we've made as a nation, right? The nation was founded on biblical principles to worship the Lord. Granted, nobody's done everything perfectly, and there's been a lot of stuff that's been bad, but the point is that we were founded to serve the Lord, and then we very obviously turned our backs on Him, and and it's been a landslide since then. We've just been downhill since the Bible's been taken out of schools, and now we have school shootings. Send the kids to schools where we took the Bibles out, and the kids are being gunned down in the schoolyard, and nobody sees the connection. Right. (laughs) So... I really feel that it's a spiritual warfare kind of thing where the enemy has his best agents in there trying to take out people and to kind of weaponize the LGBT, make it a political thing, which it really shouldn't be. It's not a matter of, you know, an an equality kind of thing. It's biblically, and that's the challenge, I think, that you're dealing with. The Bible says Satan's blinded the minds of the the unbelievers, that they would believe a lie, that they can't see the the light of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're dealing with. You're trying to speak across that divide to somebody who doesn't have the mind of Christ or the Holy Spirit. They could never possibly understand what you're saying. But in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and male and female, and he created woman out of man's rib to be his helpmate. And that's the grand design. There's no room for a third sex. And I think the enemies just really come after that and try to reverse roles. Not only do we have the reversal of roles in homosexuality now, but we also have reversal of roles in the home that I mentioned earlier, where the, the wife wants to take over the husband's role and that sort of thing. So I think these are challenges that the enemy is bringing. The initial role reversal, the biggest role reversal, most destructive role reversal we've ever seen is Adam and Eve in the garden, right? Mm -hmm. She was to be the wife, to be the helpmate, and she took it upon herself and made a decision that she was not authorized to make. And it's caused the downfall and the damnation of many. And we're still reversing the rules. We're still allowing Satan to come in and convince us the grass is greener on the other side, that we should have a role that was not designed for us that a man should be a woman, a woman should be a man, that a husband should be a wife, a wife should be a husband. We should know by now that from the lessons we've learned, the true satisfaction, true fulfillment is found in the role that we were built 
created, designed to do, to carry out. Male's not less than female or female less than male, right? Right. We each have equal value. It's just a matter of positional authority, positional power. Who did the Lord give authority in the home and in the church? Definitely. So before we go into this next section, Matt, I want to give you an opportunity to tell the folks how they can reach you, tell them about your book. I know you have the straight series. You have two books on Amazon. I'll put those on my website and put them in the feature section in the book so folks can either go to Amazon or go to Amazon through my website and get them. So take the opportunity to do this. Okay, the books are called Straight. That's the name of the series. And the first book is Straight. And then it's an ex-gay prodigal story. And that really the timeline for that book is early childhood into repentance, 2010. So that's 1978. I was born in 2010, repentance. And that's really the story of a prodigal. It's really an ex-gay prodigal story. A lot of scripture tying in. So it really falls back on scripture and, and roots everything in scripture as best I could. And Straight Two is the second book, and that picks up the timeline is where the other one left off. And it really focuses on that until almost now, until almost current time. But it focuses on missional, faith-building, fear-breaking missional adventures, is how I word it in the book. And it's really the concept being that in my past life, I was in bondage to fear and was afraid of a lot of things, and the Lord had a lot of work to do to release me of those fears so that I could be a witness for Him. So it's a lot of evangelism stories in different countries, from Cambodia to Thailand, and when I first came over here, I went to neighboring countries to kind of get a feel for the lay of the land, and the Lord gave opportunities to do interesting, exciting things like skydiving and things like that, and witness along the way. I think it can be encouraging to just about anybody. It's not just for someone coming out of a gay lifestyle, but it can be for any Christian who's kind of lackluster or kind of lukewarm in their walk. It might need a little kickstart. It can kind of help to ensues, I think, hopefully, and encourage folks in their walk and trust in Christ. And your website is xgaywitness.com. xgaywitness.com. Great. All right. So the Bible says in Second Corinthians five seventeen, Matt. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Tell us after that point in two thousand and ten, when you truly repent and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, what changes were evident in your life? Yes, we mentioned earlier. We already hit on the fact that. When I repented and gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ in 2010, that I wasn't completely a finished work. And But your question is about what were those immediate effects. And that's very, very important because when you say one thing, then it sounds like you're downplaying the other. The biggest immediate impact was the peace that passes understanding. I'll never forget that. Amen. Getting up from the floor from doing those sit-ups and looking at myself in the mirror, I saw a genuine smile on my face without alcohol or drugs. Praise the Lord. I just remember resting that night, being able to rest. I knew that I was forgiven. I knew that Satan had no power over me. The addiction that had kept me in chains and bondage, just walking that sin cycle, that sin circle, didn't have control over me anymore. Now, was there a walk-off period? Yes, there was about two months there that I still drank to a degree and still acted out to a degree. So there was a walk-off period of breaking those human habits. But it came to a point where it's like you're sitting there with a drink looking at it thinking, this is ridiculous because there's no reason for me to be doing this anymore. I'm a new creature in Christ. And so praise God, it's been July 27th, 2010 was my final drink cigarette drug. Praise the Lord. Praise and God. June 25th, my last interaction with men. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Do you think that the way your barriers removed would be effective in reaching people in the culture today? Now, your context right now is Cambodia, but it doesn't matter if they're in Cambodia, in the U.S. Do you think that the way your barriers removed can be 
used in the lives of others to remove their barriers today or have things changed? This question calls me back to something that we touched on a bit already, is that the strength of American culture now and the way things have become so extreme toward the LGBT cause. And I think there's such a feeling of sense of identity, false identity, this is who I am, kind of, I am attracted to men, therefore, this is who I am. I am gay. And I think that's really what makes it so challenging in the US. I think that in my situation, like I said, I had to really get on my back. I had to really hit rock bottom before I was willing to look up. And I think sadly, that might be the same case for many in the LGBT. So Matt, you are a missionary in Cambodia, as we have alluded to throughout this podcast. Firstly, where in the world is Cambodia for those that are geologically challenged, maybe like I am? Mm -hmm. So tell us where exactly is Cambodia? And tell us some more about Cambodia, the capital, the the population, the people group, you know. Cambodia is between Vietnam and Thailand. Population is about 17 million people. Capital city is Phnom Penh, which is a little over 2 million people. Mm. People group is Khmer. You might remember the Khmer Rouge from the the Pol Pot era, 1970s. There was a Hitler-style dictator that rose to power. He promised the people he would take them back to the ancient glory of the Angkor Empire, which Cambodia was a part of, if they followed him into kind of communist ideologies, if they broke all ties with the West and technology and went back to the farmlands. And through all that, when people followed, he slaughtered, estimates vary, but roughly a third of his own people. So it was a horror story, a very demonic time. And today, very much in a kind of rebuild. 1990s, the UN came in and things kind of opened back up. Humanitarian aid, kind of like a Haiti type of thing where NGOs, a lot of organizations, the Red Cross, for example, came in and offered relief. And so today, it's estimated that over 95% identify as Buddhist. And that's very much apparent when you speak to people. It's very much like, strangely, to relate it to homosexuality, but people will really have that same feeling of identity, like, I am Khmer, or I'm Cambodian, therefore I am Buddhist. Almost like, that Christianity is not an option for me, that's for you. And sometimes they'll say, in response to the gospel, people will say, oh, Jesus, oh, okay, and maybe they agree that he's good. Like, pray Yesu la'al. But then they'll say that, He's the God of the West. He's the God of your country. Mm. And you think kind of about the reason and logic behind that. So they're saying that one God is responsible for this country. Does that mean that he created this country and then another one created this one? Or or what are they saying? Buddhism, in my understanding, doesn't really have a concept of God the creator. So I think they're just saying in general that their traditions and their rituals and so on, their idolatry means that they're inclined to be Buddhist. Tell us about the burden that the Lord placed on your heart for Cambodia. How did you end up in Cambodia among all other nations that you could have gone to? Yeah, 2010, the Lord delivered me from a gay lifestyle, got into a local church. It was a big church, and there were many opportunities for serving and getting plugged in. They were very missions-minded and had missions partnership with Kenya, for example, another missions partnership with several other countries, Russia, Cambodia was one that was just getting started. They made an announcement on a Sunday morning and said, you know, 10 o'clock or 1030, whenever it was, anyone who's interested might want to go downstairs to room 206 because they're going to have a information session about the Cambodia partnership that's starting. I went downstairs and I sat in the back row and the video started to play of the tuk-tuk and the, the motorbike going through Cambodia and the guy that was running the partnership started to talk and I just, tears started to flow and flow and I couldn't, <laughs> oh, wow. couldn't stop crying. And it was just undoubtedly something that the Lord wanted to do. So I joined the partnership and they started to meet. I think we met about once a month and started to plan a yearly trip. So I went there three times on short-term mission. My first mission was to India, actually, before Cambodia really got up and running. And then, so I got some exposure to kind of short-term missions, the lay of the land and everything, and just really loved it and really 
had been working in a bank for 15 years and the facts and figures and IT stuff, the stuff we were doing in the bank just to me was useless compared to sharing the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ that any of us could drop over dead in five minutes. The Lord could come back in judgment any moment. And all these people around us are not ready. And here I am in a bank. It just, yeah. <laughs> after all he had done for me, it just didn't make sense. So I trusted the Lord. He trained me through the banking. And they say nothing goes to waste with him. And so he really used all this stuff to prepare me. I got into public speaking class to break the fear of public speaking. He led in a lot of interesting ways. And then eventually the bank tried to get me to support the LGBT agenda when diversity and inclusion became a big thing. Diversity and inclusion sounded great at the onset. I thought, what's this? It sounds like something really, you know, fairness and equality and that kind of stuff. And But then underneath that umbrella is this LGBT agenda where it would require me to support the path that I followed almost to my own destruction. Mm. So there I am telling other people to follow this, that it's a good thing and endorsing their lifestyles. And so long story short, the Lord let out on that note. And I was a taxi, like an Uber driver for a couple of months and praying that the Lord would lead and what to do. And, and I really felt impressed. And he was saying, Cambodia, Cambodia, Cambodia. So I reached out to contacts over here connected with one guy. and He said, I had met him during the short-term missions. He said, I have a school now. It just opened a school a while ago. You can work for me. And our pastor here, Baptist Church down the road, you can teach in the church. So he connected me with those two opportunities. And that's how it started. Very much independent. The Lord called me and I knew it and led me over here. And in some ways, I kind of put the cart before the horse, but I've learned a lot through the challenges. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are some of the things that you think someone should keep in mind if the Lord perhaps is calling them to serve in Cambodia? What should we keep in mind? The easiest way to build a relationship to share the gospel is by teaching English. Because of the genocide here in the 1970s, the majority, the vast majority of the population, very high percentage, I can't remember the percentage right now, but is like the 20s range the best range of folks that are you know, trying to move on to the next stage in life, thinking about university and that sort of thing, really want to learn English in order to have a better shot at getting a job in the service industry where the pay is higher and all that. And so it's a wide open door when it comes to teaching English, many opportunities for that, especially if you're willing to just volunteer to do that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that really sticks out when bring up this question is, strangely, what I imagined before coming over here would be the big, big challenges. And this carries over to other things in life, I think. But the biggest challenges in my mind that I worried about were the smallest challenges, and the smallest ones were the biggest ones. <laughs> <laughs> what are some examples of that? Yeah, like individualism versus collectivism. People even write, Christian scholars will write books about this sort of thing nowadays. And mm -hmm. from the American perspective, what you see people writing and talking about is that individualism has been the downfall of America. That's kind of their diagnosis. I don't really know that I, I don't really believe that for sure. But individualism has its downsides, obviously. It maybe promotes some selfishness and, and that sort of thing and lack of unity. But I think there are some perks to it. I think there are some good things about it. Collectivism over here promotes conformity. And the downside of that when it comes to sharing the gospel is that when somebody really wants to step out and give their life to Christ, they are met with kind of coercion, kind of like you'll be excluded from society. When the Buddhist holiday comes, you'll be ashamed to the family when you don't join us in the temple and that sort of thing. So individualism versus collectivism, that's been a challenge for me. I think the biggest challenge really. And it's kind of how to blend in enough to share the gospel, how to be part of just enough to get the gospel through has been a challenge. In the beginning, I said to the same friend that I mentioned that he was my boss in the beginning. I worked in his school and everything mm -hmm. and actually lived near their place and so on, ate dinner with them a lot. And I said, I want to be just like all the Cambodians. I want to do everything they do. 
And I eventually learned that that wasn't <laughs> possible. <laughs> so I got food poisoning. We came here on a short-term mission and a missionary that had been here for many, many years from Canada, he said to the short-term mission group, he said, you'll see like a food truck, you know, a food cart pull up and you'll see all the Cambodian kids run over and they'll get ice cream from the food cart and everyone will be fine. And he said, don't go to the food cart. He said, your stomach, your system is not programmed. It's not prepared to handle that level of bacteria and whatever's different about the way things are handled here. He said, you'll be in the hospital for three days and they'll be fine. <laughs> so that's what happened with me. I got food poisoning. I was severely dehydrated. We're here not far from the equator. I had no idea how to handle that because I'm from Pennsylvania. The worst it gets is just three months of kind of a little bit of heat, sometimes pretty intense, but nothing like here. So I was severely hydrated to the point where I was like, in bed, like, I don't want to move. I don't know why I have zero energy. And I, I didn't even know that it was dehydration. It just hit me so hard. And it was like, I couldn't get out of it. So after I figured that out, I've been carrying this massive bottle of water with me pretty much everywhere I go. <laughs> so there were a lot of growing pains with that. And the collectivism, from a Western perspective, it feels like invasion of privacy sometimes, that it's so much group think, and we all do the same thing. And we're all homogenous. And we all conform. And even when I would go to the grocery store, go to the market and bring something back, people would say in the beginning, what is that? Where did you get it? How much did you pay for it? They would ask, like, itemize everything. That <laughs> <laughs> so those were challenges, but I've learned to cope with those. And, you know, at the core of this thinking, this question, one thing comes to mind. My aunt came over here and she was here to visit for a little bit. And she said, why Cambodia? of all the places. And I guess I had been here, I haven't been here too long since 2016 in, in Southeast Asia, but I've been here, I guess, long enough that I kind of forgot the beginning of it all. And it's like I had to sit down and kind of think through how did it happen? And because I'm thrilled with Cambodia, I absolutely love it. I think the people are so kind and sweet and nice and gentle and the tropical fruit is excellent and the weather's great and I love to ride motorbikes. I love the lifestyle and the pace of it and the greetings and the, I just love everything about it. But I had to sit down and think that through because from a secular standpoint, if you were just looking for somewhere abroad to live, you could find more exciting places than Cambodia, I'm sure. So when I sat down and thought about it, I thought, the Lord chose me to come to Cambodia. He gave me a heart for Cambodia, and I'm making the most of it. That's not to downplay it because it's an amazing place, but I'm making the most of it. And to me, it feels so natural to be here because he's programmed me that way. He's prepared me for it. He's given me a heart. So the Lord gives the heart, the passion for the people. He gives the tear in your eye about somebody coming to Christ or the prospect of it. It's all from him, and that's the value of coming from the deep sin that I was in, is that when the Lord brought me to repentance and then sent me out to the dog park in Pittsburgh, you know, those first weeks and months when I was learning to share my testimony, what the Lord did for me, walking the dog, and then we would encounter a prostitute or somebody in the park. I lived in kind of a sketchy area in Pittsburgh, and that was the thing that was so real to me, that when I shed a tear because somebody came to Christ, or when I had goosebumps walking away from sharing the gospel with somebody, it was Him through me. Because just a month or two before, I could have cared less. Amen. You know what I mean? I didn't even care about myself, let alone anybody else. <laughs> Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. You know, the Bible in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, talk about they are Jews and how they were receptive to the gospel. And if you ever look through Acts chapter 2, you know that the day of Pentecost, the Jews, quote-unquote, if you put it in modern times, they were church. They know creation. They know the God of creation. They know that the Messiah was going to come. Their barrier was that they didn't realize the Messiah has come. So the apostles then were preaching to them about, hey, the same Jesus that you crucify is the Messiah. If you skip over to Acts chapter 17, now Paul is preaching to the Athenians, and they're not church. So Paul starts preaching to them at creation, saying, hey, this unknown God that you're alluding to is actually the creator of the universe. And then he went from creation and then get into the gospel. 
When you look at the culture of Cambodia, you just alluded to what the culture was like. When you look into the culture of Cambodia, would you say it's more like Acts chapter 2, where majority of the people are church, majority of the people know the creator God, or is it a situation like Acts chapter 17, where they actually don't know God, and you have to really start at a point where you have to teach them who God is, who the creator is, and stuff like that? Acts chapter 17, and in chapter 17, Paul's in Athens, and he references the unknown God. So they're worshiping all these gods, and he points to the unknown God, and he said, this God I'd like to proclaim to you. And that's so perfectly Cambodia. So interesting you would ask this question, because my dad, when I first came over, he suggested, he said, Acts chapter 17, Paul in Athens is perfect for that, because I was wow. explaining what's it like. <laughs> and so I actually got up in front of the church and read the scripture and preached about it in one of my first opportunities here. It's the biggest challenge here. Missionaries will kind of caution us and they'll say, kind of be careful when you're counting hands. Let's say that we share the gospel with a group of kids and everybody says, yep, I'm ready to pray to receive Christ. And then they pray along and they recite out loud the prayer and they would say, be careful when you're counting hands because people have a tendency in a culture like Cambodia to kind of never say no, to appease the teacher. The teacher is kind of the second parent type of a thing. And so they would be very much more likely to just go along with whatever you say rather than to go against it. It would be very rare that somebody wouldn't pray. And so counting hands really isn't an accurate estimate of who really is going to follow the Lord and faithfully, like the sower and the seed talks about kind of one in four, right? And that scenario actually followed the Lord. And so here, the biggest challenge is the exclusivity of Christ. Just like Paul in Athens, people will say, oh, okay, well, Christians came to the community and they brought big bags of rice and did nice things and had a presentation and shared about Jesus. I think Jesus is good. But then when it comes down to what that means, that can have no other gods before him, have to turn away from Buddhism to follow Christ. The exclusivity of Christ is what's offensive, and that's where you run into the problem. If you think about it, it's not much different from back home. Somebody comes out of their old life, out of the bar or something like that, and it's like if they can still go to the bar and go to church, they're okay. But the moment you say, nope, you got to leave that, for a lot of people, that's the problem, right? They want to walk those paths. Yep. Yeah. And one of the arguments I always make is that the culture in the U.S., I actually believe is now an Acts chapter 17 culture for majority of the folks and not Acts chapter 2. I believe if you probably go back 30, 40, 50 years ago, the U.S. culture was definitely an Acts chapter 2 culture. But today, I think is definitely a solid majority is in Acts chapter 17. I don't think the church have caught up just yet with that fact. Amen. What are some of the needs that, if filled, would make your task of sharing the gospel easier in Cambodia? I think a lot of times we look at missionaries and we don't realize that the church in the U.S. or the people in the U.S. that are supporting that missionary can actually make their task a little bit easier. So what are some of the needs that, if filled, would make your task in Cambodia a lot easier? In an ex-gay ministry, the thing that, that is the biggest challenge for me really is credibility building the credibility because sadly many who have come out of a gay lifestyle have eventually returned to it even leaders in ex-gay ministries and folks in the church know that so it's kind of like coming out of alcohol addiction or something you come into the church and everybody's like okay well you say that but let's see you walk it out for 20 or 30 years <laughs> right. till we really believe it and so that's the biggest challenge i think what would be helpful is to get these testimonies like mine, many others out there that the Lord's delivered from a gay lifestyle so that it's clear to everyone that it's possible. I think even in the church, sometimes we start to feel so discouraged that so many have gone back. Is it really even possible? Is there any hope for the LGBT? And so I think it would be encouraging to get these testimonies out. When we're home, back in Pennsylvania, back in the U.S., like last time we were there for COVID for quite a while and got into a number of churches and Christian school and shared the testimony. I'd like to have more churches to partner with, pastors who are willing to preach the difficult truth to stand with us on that. That would be very helpful. 
solid doctrine on homosexuality, on roles in the home and family. Those things are kind of tied together. So, yeah, I think those would be helpful. Is there anything that the church is doing in the U.S. that is making your mission more difficult? Yes. False teachings are the biggest challenge, I think, to what we're doing over here is false teachings. And the saddest part is that they're coming from my country. Mm. So the gospel came to so many countries from the U.S., So the tendency is to continue listening to that same pipeline. Mm -hmm. Everything that comes through that pipeline must still be true because that's where the original message came from. And wow, it seems like that's an ongoing battle to get people to understand that we can't be just following people blindly. It's not the people. We have to really know the Word of God and be like the Bereans, right? Mm -hmm. Search the scriptures and see if what they're telling us is true. Yep. So many, I think, with the homosexual thing and with who's the head of the home and the sticky stuff that nobody wants to really talk about, if we kind of go middle of the road or the liberal side and water down the truth, it puts a smile on people's faces and keeps them coming back and giving money to the church. But in the long run, it does them a disservice. Mm -hmm. It's not helping anybody. It's sending many to everlasting damnation. It's destroying homes. It's really not helping anything to tell someone something that's, we're thinking that we're doing a good thing because American culture tells us, you know, don't judge anybody and everybody get along. We have to be multicultural and somehow make this work, but we have to stand on difficult truth. The Lord's the boss. It's not up to us to decide to revise the truth. Yeah, definitely. You're listening to the Removing Barriers podcast. We're sitting down with Matt. We are finding out how, where his barriers were moved, and also learning about his mission field in Cambodia. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Antivirus software protects you from malware. But to protect your privacy and security on the web, you need a virtual private network or VPN. Did you know that Ivacy offers an easy-to-use VPN app for each of your favorite devices? From Windows, Macs, and smartphones to smart TVs, tablets, and browser extensions, and even gaming consoles. Get Ivacy for your choice of devices to secure your connection, browse with privacy, and access content from anywhere in the world. Go to ivacy.com or click the link in the show notes. Use coupon code REMOVINGBARRIERS for a 20% discount. All right, Matt, we're going to jump into a section of this podcast where we want to get to know more about some of your favorites and not necessarily rapid fire, but you can approach it like that if you'd like. So the first one is, what is your favorite scripture verse or scripture passage? And the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. First John 2, 17. Mm. What about your favorite Bible history? Other folks call them story, but we believe the Bible is true and historic. So what is your favorite Bible history? Samson and Delilah, because choosing a good Christian wife is so vitally important, Mm -hmm. especially in this struggle, somebody coming out of a gay lifestyle, kind of a little bit more vulnerable in terms of masculinity than maybe some other men. And I think it's really important to take your time, make sure it's the Lord's choice and that she's a proven true believer. Yes, mm. whosoever findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtain a favor from the Lord. Amen. I've obtained that favor. <laughs> <laughs> what would be, of all the scripture passages, what would be the most convicting scripture to you, in your opinion? The Great Commission, Matthew mm. 28, 18 to 20. Amen. What about the most comforting scripture to you? Something that when you want a hug from the Lord, you can run into this verse and get it. One that often brings a tear to my eye, these things I have spoken unto you that you might have peace in the world. You may have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. John sixteen thirty three for those challenging days. Yep. That's awesome because, boy, doesn't it? It looks and feels like sometimes that evil has the upper hand or that it's running rampant now, but what a comfort that that scripture is. Praise God for that. All right. What about yeah. your favorite hymn of the faith? Victory in Jesus. Man, all of us need that Absolutely. victory in Jesus. One of the favorites. <laughs> okay. <laughs> give, us a, give us another one. Another one that kind of dovetails with, with that one about difficult days 
farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. That's really been a comfort. I think in the initial days when the Lord first delivered me, they call that the honeymoon period. It feels yeah. like the Lord's right beside you. Mm-hmm. You know, He's speaking to you so clearly. And then you go through kind of wilderness times and times when you don't hear from Him so clearly and, and that sort of thing. And during those times, that hymn really became real to me. Right. What about your favorite giant of the faith? Someone in the Bible, you say, man, when I grew up, I want to be like that person. Moses. Moses. Mm. Most folks don't choose Moses. Why Moses? I relate to him because he was reluctant at first. Mm. Experienced quite a bit of backlash from people he was supposed to be leading who thought he wasn't really authorized. I called one pastor. I was trying to make connections with churches back in Pennsylvania. And usually we got pretty good responses, but I talked to one on the phone and he seemed a little bit skeptical of me. And he said, huh, I never heard anyone say the Lord called him to reach the LGBT. (laughs) (laughs) Mm. I, I think the idea is I'm not real sure that I'm buying what you're saying. Witnessing to the LGBT can be kind of a thankless job sometimes. And many church leaders look down on an ex-gay guy, somebody who's come out of the lifestyle, maybe slow to trust, looking at the high rates of recidivism, Mm -hmm. stuff that's happened in the past. And standing with us puts people in the crosshairs in this political battle. You folks, for example, a lot of mainstream Christian outlets are very reluctant to kind of join hands with us because that puts them kind of in the line of fire. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much. In part, I think for purposes of self-preservation, today's church is kind of configured to shoot the wounded. So it's been really an uphill battle. Moses wasn't perfect, but he was a warrior for the Lord and fought for the people he was called to lead out of bondage. I relate to that too, no matter how rebellious or combative or ungrateful they were. And he wasn't perfect. He took credit for something that was really the Lord should have gotten the glory for, and he was under pretty intense pressure. So a lot of us have spoken out of turn and in situations like that. So I just relate to him and he's a real guy. Yeah, definitely. And talking about witnessing to gay, I must admit that it's one of the toughest group to witness to. I'm the sole winning coordinator at my church. And it seems like you have to navigate such a fine line when you're witnessing to someone who is openly gay. Firstly, most of them don't want to hear it. You know, most of them turn you away right away. As long as they realize it's something religious or something Christian or whatever, they turn you away right away. And those that do listen, they almost don't want to say something that come across unloving or you want to sometimes make sure you're not being politically correct. You also don't want to offend the person. Sometimes it's like, if they ask me direct questions, I'll give them direct answer. But other than that, I try to just present the gospel in a way that, hey, this is gospel. That's why talking to you was so refreshing because you kind of give me some some ideas and some ways to go in terms of presenting the gospel. And of course, I've been on your website and I've listened to you and I'm like, you know what? I can tweak the way I witness to someone, a gay person, next time I see them. Because, yeah, I think being real with them and straight up with them will be more effective than trying to toe the political line. Amen. Praise the Lord. Definitely. I think the problem of credibility also kind of goes both ways, right? The church is coming to witness to the LGBT because of all the hurts of the past from the church. The LGBT also is slow to believe and slow to trust. (laughs) So you have the same kind of dynamic there. So that's why I think the humility of, like you said, sharing, kind of being more real with them. And I think that would be like, okay, well, this guy wouldn't say this if you weren't genuine. Mm-hmm. Right, nobody's going to admit this stuff. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He 
sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. All right, so Matt, we have been going for some time now. How can those barriers be removed in the life of others? You talk about your barriers, the barrier of fear, the barrier of pride. And you talk about your sinful past. Imagine you're witnessing to someone with similar barriers like you. How can those barriers be removed in their life? Jesus is the door. He's the way out of a gay lifestyle to peace, to a better, more rewarding, more fulfilling life. I would say that for the LGBT, your temptation is not who you are. Sin is not who you are. The Lord has a better plan. The Bible says, he who saves his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. And then it goes on to say, what will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? So we're trying to grip onto this world. And we mentioned this world will pass away and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. So we're trying to grip onto something that's decaying quickly, passing away. And this life is just a vapor. Any one of us could die in the next five minutes. So it's not about, quote unquote, being happy here. It's about being prepared for the next life that could come in the next several minutes. Yeah. The Bible says sin is pleasure for a season. So might be happy for an hour or two hours or a short period of time. But I know from experience that especially the male gay relationships, at least the ones that remain faithful, are usually very short-lived. So the Lord has something much better than that, much more enduring satisfaction and peace that passes understanding, praise the Lord. But God created the earth and everything in it. We sinned against him. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're born with a deceitful heart, a sinful nature various temptations towards sin, but God sent his one and only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come down from heaven and die on the cross for our sins. He's the lamb of God without blemish. He has no sin and died on the cross for our sins to pay the sacrifice in full 100% for our sins. He rose again and went back up to heaven. And the only way to be saved 
is to repent and put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to turn away from following our deceitful hearts, from our evil desires, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ according to his word, as revealed in his word. And the Bible says that he will come into our hearts and give us the peace that passes understanding, will conform us as we follow him, as we read his word, to the image of his son, to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that if we pass away, if we die five minutes later after we've given our lives to Christ genuinely, that we would go to heaven. So our sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ, not by our good works. But if we truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we will follow him and we'll be faithful in good works that he's laid out for us to walk into. So praise the Lord for a second chance, another opportunity, the Bible says, and such were some of you. The Bible says that homosexuals will not enter the kingdom, but such were some of you. So even in the Corinthian church, there were ex-gays, believe it or not, even back then, that the Lord had delivered from a gay lifestyle. It's proven. My testimony is another proven example that the Lord can do it. So trust him, repent, give your life to him today. He has a better plan. Praise God. Amen. We've been talking with Matt from X Gay Ministries. He has two books, the straight series that you can find on either removingbarriers.net forward slash books. It will be at the top featured section. And or you can go to his website or even on Amazon. You can find him. And how else can folks get a hold of you, Matt? XGayWitness.com is the easiest way. There are links there to our Castaway Ministry site, which is our missionary site, and link to buy the book on Amazon.com. There's a contact button there, so you can reach me there. Matt, thank you for joining us on the Removing Barriers podcast. Thank you for having me, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. To get a hold of us, to support this podcast, or to learn more about Removing Barriers, go to removingbarriers.net. This has been the Removing Barriers podcast. We attempted to remove barriers so that we all can have a clear view of the cross.